Well, thank you very much, Marcus. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the FIFA case and the long reach of U.S. criminal enforcement. And in many ways, it's a very strange case um, for a number of reasons. And it's in some ways very different from the typical corporate criminality case that we've been talking about over the last day and a half. But I want to start out with uh, a very simple thing. Of when you think of the United States, of course, you and you think of sports in the United States, you think of things like baseball, right? Um, you think of football, and my team, the uh, Dallas Cowboys, going against my son's team, the New York Giants, right there. And of course, you think about basketball. And you never think about what you guys all call football because that's not something that is something that an American really does. I played what we call soccer as a small child, um, but generally it's not something that's a big sport in the United States. So football in the United States. Well, first off, the most important thing you have to keep in mind is that we don't call it football. We call it soccer. And we have had some really spectacular players play in the United States, so don't count us out. So this was the star of the New York Cosmos. Some of you might claim him for Brazil, but he was a New Yorker uh, playing for New York. Um, this, you guys might claim he is a UK citizen, but he plays for the Los Angeles Clippers. Now, we do have a homegrown star, um, Mia Hamm. Uh, so the United States is certainly getting better, but we don't have a Beckenbauer, we don't have a Beckham, we don't have a Pele, not yet, we have Mia Hamm. I'm gonna show you now what I think is perhaps the most famous photograph in US football, and that's this one. Um, and you see here, this is the takedown where the United States took down what we call the FIFA case. And you see some very famous characters. Right in the front, you see Loretta Lynch, who is the Attorney General of the United States. You see Jim Comey, who was my former boss when I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office. And uh, the heads of the FBI, et cetera. Um, this was a major matter for the United States. So it's a bizarre case in many ways. Um, and there's some reasonable questions that are worth asking about this particular case. Why is it prosecuted in the United States at all? Uh, how is it prosecuted in the United States at all? What are advantages to the United States being involved in this case and prosecuting it? And are there concerns for the world, for law enforcement, for your countries in having the United States take a leading role, let's face it, the leading role in this case? Um, also, there's a very strange thing. We've been talking so far about the corporate body being somehow at fault here and being really the culprit. And we have a dispute about whether you have corporate criminality and what should be attributed to the corporation. Um, what is FIFA's role here? And you're going to find out it's a very interesting role and in that FIFA is casting itself as the victim of this crime. Um, what are some of the challenges to prosecution? And then so what are some of the thoughts going forward at a global level, not just about football, as you would call it, or sports generally, but what does this tell us about criminality in, in the corporate context and how should we think about it from a global perspective? So, I'm going to touch briefly on the case, uh, talk to you a little bit about how the, you know, some of the results of the case without getting into too much detail because we could spend a week going through the case. This is the most recent indictment. It is 238 pages long. I'm not going to read it to you. Um, so, but I'll talk about some of the highlights. Then we'll talk about U.S. jurisdiction and interest. And notice they're two separate words because it turns out the U.S. having jurisdiction isn't the same thing as the U.S. having an interest in it. U.S. oftentimes has very broad jurisdictional reach, but it doesn't mean that we prosecute every case for which we have jurisdiction. Federal prosecutors like Amy and, and me used to, and I used to be, we have great discretion about when we prosecute. Why did the U.S decide to prosecute this case. Um, talk a little bit about the advantages and challenges of having a case prosecuted by the United States. We're all very impressed with the prosecution, but it's important to step back for a moment and say, should we be impressed by this prosecution? Um, I'm going to talk to you about FIFA as a victim, which is a very strange twist in this whole thing, and then a couple of thoughts about going forward. 
So briefly, um, there was a big takedown on May 27, 2015. They announced charges against 18 people. They charged racketeering, wire fraud, and money laundering. Wire fraud is very interesting here because when you have fraud, you have a victim. And who is the victim in a fraud scheme? And that ends up becoming quite important because it turns out FIFA is the victim, which changes everything in this whole case. Um, they arrested uh, or they charged a number of very high-ranking executives within FIFA, including Jeffrey Webb, who was the head of the CONCACAF, which is the United States, uh, Caribbean, and Central America. Um, Jack Warner, who is uh, in key to the whole uh, case. And there were really three categories of defendants, um, football officials. Um, there were also sports media and marketing uh, executives, businessmen, bankers, and a bunch of intermediaries who are involved in the whole thing. They also announced on the same day that there had been earlier pleas, and Amy Jeffress uh, and Tom uh, had recently talked about cooperation. Um, this was a revelation that, in fact, some folks had been cooperating, including Daryl Warner and da da Darren Warner, who are Jack Warner's sons. They are cooperating against their father. So it is an ugly business that we work in, and um, so they, they entered into plea agreements, and Reading through the tea leaves, they are cooperating against uh, Jack Warner and others. In addition, Chuck Blazer, who was the head of the uh, CONCACAF for a time period and the US Soccer Federation, he's the guy who's very colorful with the big beard uh, and had uh, an apartment in Trump Tower. He had a separate apartment for his own cats where he kept his cats, and a very colorful character. Uh, he recently passed away, which is actually going to be a bit of a challenge for the United States because he's a central cooperator in the whole thing. Uh, generally, they charged uh, bribes and kickbacks with respect to sports marketing, um, with respect to the sponsorship of the Brazil Football uh, Federation, the selection of the 2010 World Cup, and also with respect to one of the FIFA presidential elections. Then what happened, and this is very common in US cases, is there was a bit of a lull. And what happened is federal prosecutors start flipping people. And what we see is in come December of 2016, or 2015, they bring charges against 16 additional people. They charge them again with the same sort of crimes. This time, there were seven CONCACAF, which is the United States, North America, and then also CONMEBOL, which is uh, South America, the South American Football Association. A bunch of people got charged. Similar sorts of cases, bribery in connection with marketing rights and, and various decisions within FIFA. So the scorecard, I pulled this off of the DOJ's website the other day. So far, it's 24 guilty pleas, three are scheduled for trial coming up. A bunch of people are about to be sentenced uh, in the next few days. And in true American fashion, it is big, it is very loud, it is very splashy, um, and we'll see what happens going forward. So um, I want to now get to sort of from the lawyer's point of view, the what I think is the interesting issue is not jurisdiction, but interest. And also, I think FIFA as a victim is also very interesting. So um, one of the things that we used to worry about, and, and the United States is always worried about this, is are we the world's policemen? And in some ways, um, there is a... Um, there's a certain pride in that, and there's a certain sense that you know maybe the United States has to be the world's policeman. But we're all we often feel actually quite guilty about that because we don't think of ourselves as imperialists. I'm sure that a lot of you probably disagree with that. Um, but but uh, on the other hand, you know it, it, there's a sense oftentimes that you have worldwide jurisdiction. And my first boss as U.S. attorney was Mary Jo White, and she used to keep a globe on her desk, and she used to joke. Uh, in in, in uh, light moments that that was the jurisdiction of the Southern District of New York, Manhattan, uh, because you could bring cases into there if you could find a jurisdictional hick. Book. Now, oftentimes we have very broad jurisdiction in the United States, and some of these are extremely thin jurisdictional reads, but really dramatic US interest. So for example, terrorism cases. It doesn't take a whole lot for the United States to grab jurisdiction in a terrorism case. We talked about uh, FCPA cases. Yes, certainly US corporations, if something happens in the United States, it's easy to grab jurisdiction then. But there are cases where there's a conspiracy. 
And a co-conspirator may have never been in the United States, may have had nothing to do with the United States, but because she is part of a bigger conspiracy that did touch on the United States, she can get arrested and brought to New York City in, to face trial. And then sanctions programs. Uh, Amy Jeffress works a lot in this area, and there, um, if a dollar transaction, if, for example, Iran sanctions or whatever, if a dollar transaction goes through a US bank, the US, because it feels it's in its interest to enforce the sanctions will assert jurisdiction. The FIFA case is actually easy from a legal point of view. It is, in some ways, a mundane case from a jurisdictional point of view in that um, you read the indictment and they go to great pains. It's almost slightly embarrassing about how hard they try and make it into a US case. They talk about the centrality of the US financial system. There were computer servers in, in New York. There were meetings in the United States. CONCACAF was in New York City for a while, and then it's in Miami. Uh, Chuck Blazer lived famously in Trump Tower. And there's a conspiracy touching the United States. So from a, from a strictly legal jurisdictional basis, there's really no viable challenge to the US jurisdiction here. But that doesn't mean that you have to take the case. For the United States to take the case, you look to the US Attorney's Manual that Amy talked about earlier, and the thing you look at is, is there a substantial federal interest that would be served by the prosecution, uh, and should the prosecution be declined because the person is subject to effective prosecution in another jurisdiction? So given how important soccer is to the United States when it's really not important in Germany or Switzerland or other places, plainly you would think that this case just has to be in the United States. And it's a, it's a very valid question about why the United States of all countries is asserting its jurisdiction here. We're not talking about countries that couldn't assert jurisdiction. Why the United States? Jim Comey, who was my boss and was a terrific boss, um, explained it as this way. He says, if you touch our shores with your corrupt enterprise, whether that's through meetings or using our world-class financial system, you will be ac held accountable. It's a wonderful statement. It's also not true, because we all know that there are many cases that touch our shores. Any dollar-denominated transaction touches the shores of the United States, and we don't actually go after it. Why this particular case? It's worth asking. Um, I'll give you my own cynical view. It's, um, they had a cooperator. The ch cooperator was Chuck uh, Blazer. Um, they got him on something completely different, and it was a big, sexy case, and let's just take it out. And they did. And, and I think that's in part what's going on. Now, the less cynical view is we are actually getting better at soccer. Um, we're, we, we, we are, um, and, and it's becoming more and more of an important um, uh, sport for us. We lost the World Cup bid to Qatar, and there were certainly uh, bad feelings about that, and there was some speculation that that might not have been completely kosher. Um, so I think that there was a sense also that the United States felt that it was that um, charitably that the United States did have a, an interest in pursuing the case as well. So um, let me go on. Um, Advantages and disadvantages of a US prosecution. Um, Amy and Tom talked about this a little bit. I'm going to go into um, probably not the same depth that Amy did, but just touch on something. Um, th the mindset that is drilled into you as a federal prosecutor is that every arrest is an opportunity. And I think this is very different. I've worked with prosecutors all over the world, and this is actually a huge advantage to US prosecutions. If you arrest somebody, you don't think, OK, the case is over. Therefore, I'm just going to you know, take it to trial or get a guilty plea and, and have the person have a sentence, sentence. What you do is you take that and you try and flip that person. And then you try and build networks. I had, like Amy also did violent cases. Uh, on August 23, 2000, a cooperator came in on a gun charge. And we flipped him. And by the time I left the US Attorney's Office, we had 56 convictions of rob violent robbers throughout the Bronx and Manhattan. Um, and it's particularly important when you're talking about white collar crime. One of the things that I've always noticed when I deal with the UK is, is that they often will try and prove cases from the outside, prove conspiracies from the outside of the conspiracy. What you can do in the United States, because we have this 
extremely well-developed cooperation framework is that you can arrest 10 people fairly early on in the case because we're allowed to arrest relatively early on in the case. You know that two or three of those might flip and then you're building the case from inside the conspiracy. Rather than guessing the answer, you know the answer. And that's a huge advantage from if you're setting up your criminal justice system. And that's, in fact, I think why the United States is a, a, a major or the major player, frankly, on white collar crime is because we're able to do that. Um, and, you know, it's particularly important when you're trying to prove criminal cases. This is, you know, you have to prove mens rea. Oftentimes in white collar cases, it's very difficult to prove that the person had the adequate mental state when you have a cooperator who talks about specific conversations that they had with another person, and that, that other person said stuff that was incriminating and revealed the mental state, that allows the prosecutor in the United States to clean out the entire conspiracy, or at least a, as much of the conspiracy as you're able to get. And I think that's very effective. Um, Amy talked about the 5K process, and that is really, I used to, we used to call it the currency of the realm, because if you can get somebody to cooperate, that brings down the whole case. Um, so I'm not gonna dwell on this, both Tom and Amy talked about this, but uh, the corporate criminality in the United States, keep in mind one that we have huge incentives for corp corporations to cooperate. There's also huge disincentives for corporations not to cooperate. Most of the game, as Tom was talking about, in our world when we were going in on behalf of a corporation is to try and avoid indictment. And the problem with being indicted is if you're a government contracted, you're, you're knocked out of all US government contracts. If you are a law firm, by and large, you're done. If you're an accounting firm, you're done. If you're a bank, you're done. So what you do is you try and avoid an indictment and try and resolve it beforehand. And cooperation is a way of mitigating the damage. And so that gives the DOJ a way of really turning people like Tom and Amy and I into the people who do their work for them. And it's extremely efficient for them. Um, with all of the, the pitfalls that we've talked about of, of you know, potential abuses um, and, and you know, negative consequences, still it makes the DOJ exceptionally powerful. So I won't go over this because I think Amy went over it in more detail. Um, another thing that I think is a strong, um, a, a strong power that the United States has is uh, when I became a federal prosecutor, one of the things I was very surprised at was how uh, easily it was, how easy it was to get other countries to cooperate with the United States. My own cynical view of that is, is that when you send an MLAT, a mutual legal assistance treaty request to folks uh, in another country, uh, the agents just want a trip to New York, and so they're very eager to cooperate with the United States. But Historically, it is very easy to get people, uh, other countries, to cooperate with the United States. And you know, here uh, Loretta Lynch reached out to you know thank the Swiss for their assistance in the cooperation, because you know otherwise you know otherwise the Swiss wouldn't have been interested in the case against FIFA, which was of course housed in their own backyard. Um, and downsides to a U.S. prosecution: it is sometimes difficult to get foreign evidence. Um, a lot of countries don't cooperate with the United States when it comes to extradition. And the bottom one actually I think is, is a major one, is that while as a prosecutor in the United States you're very eager to go out and take the cases down and, and you know, have a big case and have a big press conference, um, there is a concern I have as a policy matter that other countries that can and should step up and handle the cases that frankly are in their own backyard rely on the US as a crutch. And I'm not sure that the US, by always taking the lead in these cases, is really doing the right thing in the long run. Because I think other countries need to focus on stepping up and doing these cases. You just can't rely always on the United States. So I mean, that's an issue that I'm sure we would all debate and disagree on. But um, So the next is FIFA as a victim. And this is a part that is strange, because we've been talking about corporate bodies as a, um, as a, you know, as the culprit in, in these cases. Um, here, we, um, FIFA put in a paper 
to the U.S. Attorney's Office seeking victim status, um, which is a little bizarre because I think, you know, if we had gone back two or three years ago, nobody in this room would have thought that FIFA was a victim of anything, but rather it was a place that really was due to be enforced against relatively strongly. Um, but the argument they made is actually true and, and makes sense under U.S. law, and maybe is potentially a flaw under U.S. law. But the moment you charge fraud, then the fraud is essentially that you have an individual who put his own interests before the interests of the organization that he was supposed to be re representing. He had a fiduciary duty. And so you denied the organization the honest services of that individual by bribing him. And if you bribed him, then the only one who's hurt there is FIFA. And so FIFA is the victim. So what follows from that? It turns out it's pretty dramatic because they have all sorts of rights. Every victim has all sorts of rights, and including the right to confer with the government, the, the right to timely and full restitution, compensation. So what comes into compensation? Well, compensation in the United States, restitution in the United States is mandatory. And you are entitled under two different statutes to get uh, your expenses to make you whole at the end of the day. All right, so what do you get out of this? And this becomes quite interesting. Um, you're entitled to the full amount of your losses as a victim. All right, so what does that mean? Certainly maybe the bribe money, et cetera, that should come back to you. But it turns out also is that you're entitled to other expenses incurred during participation in the investigation or prosecution of the offense or attendance at proceedings relating to the offense. In other words, if you hire an expensive lawyer to do an investigation on your behalf, you may well be able to get your legal fees. And there is a case that, um, that unfortunately I'm responsible for uh, called the United States versus Amato in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals where a corporation hired outside counsel and the outside counsel incurred a lot of expenses to help the government with the case, and uh, the government then, or the court then ordered that the outside counsel's fees should be reimbursed by the defendant. So that's what FIFA will potentially get going forward, but it creates a very strange situation where you have, at least in the public eye, a, an organization that uh, was just full with corruption, and at the same time may be able to get a lot of money um, out of the whole situation. So it's a little, a little bizarre. All right, so going forward, um, there's a number of questions, and I'm going to focus just on a couple of them. Uh, what will happen in the trials? We don't know. Um, will there be more charges to come? I suspect there will be more charges to come. I'm involved in the case, and uh, I can't I won't talk about who, who I'm involved with. My person is not charged, and I don't expect him to be charged. Uh, but I do think that there will be other charges. They've continued to flip people, and that means that the case is not over. Um, really interesting, and we'll look to see what happens in, uh, in October, is will the judge be merciful, or will the judge really throw the book at these people? And you know, I think there's going to be some serious arguments that when you're talking about a South American official having really no connection with the United States, what exactly is the U.S. interest here? And should a federal judge in the United States be throwing them in jail for many, many years, given the U.S. interest is relatively uh, uh, attenuated? Um, the, uh, you know, another thing is, will the, United, will the other countries continue to cooperate? Uh, there are some household names, some heroes to a lot of people in this, uh, in this room. And what will happen if one of those people is indicted? Will they be handed over to the United States? And then one of the things that was talked about earlier is what will happen with the new administration, You know, the America first rhetoric. Uh, my own view on that is that, um, you know, I was talking with Amy afterwards. Um, we, we've been talking about corporations and how you change corporations over time um, and how difficult it can be to change a corporate, cor uh, corporate direction and corporate culture. One of the biggest corporations in, in the world is the United States government. And the United States government is run by people like Amy Jeffress. And, and it's very, very difficult for an administration that really doesn't understand the government to be, actu to be actually able to change how the government actually works. So with that, I'll leave it open for questions.